Hello, 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 eco-fictologists. Welcome back to my channel. My name is Lovis, and today I want to talk to you about the opias. That's right, I mean the dystopias and the utopias. These two categories really split the readership, I find. Lovers of dystopias uh, find utopias boring and unrealistic, while utopia fans find dystopias too dark and depressing. For myself, it's very much mood dependent. Sometimes I love a good dystopian, because I'm sure to find a new nitty gritty societal order that I just find so fascinating. And on other days, I just can't stomach it. It just goes to show that we are all different and we all like our stories told differently, which is the beauty of fiction because there is something for everyone. In the context of ecofiction, I want to talk about what dystopias and utopias have to offer, and in which situations one might be better suited than the other. Dystopian narratives are very common in ecofiction, which is not really that surprising. Uh, so common, in fact, that when I was first discovering the genre, I thought it all had to be dystopian. It all had to be depressing times and warning signs. But not so. Hopeful utopian ecofiction has firmly staked its claim on the readership as well, leaving you the opportunity to do your own pick and mix of emotions. So pick your sides or straddle the fence. Let's talk about the opias. on this last week that one contribution that ecofiction can make to the conversation about climate change and how we deal with it both in a mental health respect but also in our physical actions and um, is that it helps us imagine what the future might possibly look like whereas thinking about all the possibilities might be very overwhelming ecofiction uh, presents you with one scenario at a time fully imagined and acted out on a big stage uh, so you can experience that future for yourself. Everyone has a different idea of what the future is going to look like, and depending on how pessimistic or optimistic you are, you could fall anywhere on a very wide scale. On one end of the spectrum, we have the utopias. This is where the optimists live, where we imagine a life where we have found a way for humans to live in harmony with the natural world. On the other end, we have the dystopias, the more bleak and depressing outlook that shows us uh, what we might have to do to survive in the future because we didn't clean up our act and climate change has left us in the dust. There is a lot of space in between these, but these are the extremes. So in some respects, utopias and dystopias are similar in that they look to the future and they imagine what the world will look like. Um, and they show the reader one possible way of life which is shaped by our response to climate change in the time between now and whenever the story is set. Of course, they handle that very differently. Dystopias choose the worst case scenario and chase it down that rabbit hole to see where we might end up. They act as a warning of what might happen if we don't change our ways, um, and they don't only focus on the environmental effects. Dystopian ecofiction highlights how the changes are going to cascade into every aspect of our lives. Uh, economy, politics, technology, where we get our food from, where we live. It takes the social injustices that are a reality now and it puts them into even sharper relief to show us that everything is linked. They tend to be geared more towards adult readers, at least from what I've seen so far. Um, because these dark and depressing futures have made people desperate. There are always shortages of basic human needs, like clean air, clean water, space to live, food to eat. The establishment of the social pecking order is decided on a more animalistic basis, especially in stories that focus on the lower rungs of society. Paolo Bacigalupi is a well-known eco-fiction author who falls squarely into this dystopian genre uh, for several of his books, including The Wind-Up Girl and The Water Knife. The way he imagines how climate change consequences and shortages change the way society works is fascinating, then terrifying. As much as they suck me in, I never want to live in a world created by Paolo Bacigalupi. Which I guess is the point, right? Flip that coin over and you find utopias. 
What will the world look like if we make different decisions now and we manage to slow the pace of climate change enough for us to get to a place where we can live in harmony with nature? How will our societies be structured? What kind of buildings are we going to live in? Will we put value on sustainability and equality versus convenience and greed? This doesn't necessarily mean that we have stopped developing, that we have reversed our technological advances. It just means that we are now using them to waste less, pollute less, uh, maximize our efficiency in a sustainable way. And these advances are ideally shared across classes and perceived social divides. Um, and it's not just the rich few percent who profit, but everybody, because it's not about profit anymore. Some people will say that dystopian narratives are unhelpful, that they're counterproductive, that they just add to the fear-mongering and the grief, and they don't actually motivate people to change. In an interview, uh, James Bradley, the author of Clade, which I reviewed three weeks ago, um, said that he thought dystopian narratives were an abdication of responsibility of sorts, it's like saying, eh, the world is going to end, there's nothing we can do about it. Some even say that dystopian narratives are like the boy who cried wolf, desensitizing people to the horrors of the possible repercussions of climate change when they hear about them now in real life. But probably just as many people would say that utopias are just an ostrich sticking its head in the sand, not acknowledging that there's any real danger and are therefore equally unhelpful. So what do dystopias and utopias have to offer us? Actually, I would argue that the very things that people say are their disadvantages are their greatest assets, as long as they're taken in the right context. Dystopias are supposed to scare you. They're supposed to show you a future that you really don't want in the hopes that it'll shake you out of complacency and that you will take actions that will move you in the opposite direction of that possibility. They show you the journey that we are going to take in the coming decades and they show you the pitfalls that you, so that we can avoid them so we don't go veering off on a detour that takes us to this horrible place. They give you that dose of urgency that is needed to wake people up. But you can't just have urgency and fear. You need to have something to balance it out. And that's where utopias come in. Where dystopias say, here, look at this. This is where we're going to end up if you don't change. Utopias say, but if you do change, this is where we could potentially end up. Isn't this nice? They take the climate crisis from, we're screwed, there's nothing we can do about it, to there is a way we can adapt. There is hope for living in equilibrium. It's the carrot and the stick, people. Punishment or reward. So I think that reading just one or the other gives an unbalanced view. I think you should read both because they enhance each other. Without urgency and fear, we don't need to take any action. But if there is no hope for a solution, there would be no point in taking action. They each rely on each other to actually inspire the reader to do something. So I think I'm going to stay straddling this fence between utopias and dystopias, taking a little bit from each side, depending on my mood. Maybe one day I need a little bit of positivity, maybe another day I can handle a bit of a reminder. It happens to be the case that most eco-fiction that looks to the future uh, explores a dystopian one. There are far more dystopian, cli-fi and eco-fiction books than utopians, and whether that reflects the mindset of the authors or the popularity of dystopias in the readership, I don't know. There has been an upsurge in popularity of dystopian narratives recently, but I encourage you to, to rummage around and actively find your dose of positivity, because it's there and you need it. So that's all I got for you today. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and if you have, show your love by doing some button clicking. Um, like this video and subscribe to my channel and hit that bell so you get notified every time I upload new content. I do it weekly on Wednesdays. I would love to hear any thoughts and comments you have, so leave those down below. And of course, as always, if you have any topics that you would like me to discuss on this channel, or if you have book recommendations for me, leave those down there as well. I would love to hear them. Dystopian or utopian, your choice. 
I'll see you next week, Ecofictologists.